first on BBC Two, the slippery slope of the 80s in broadcast journalism. Edward Sturton continues breaking the news. We got 30 seconds. Millions are watching. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Good evening. Soon after Jimmy Carter became president... Carter. In the mid-70s, American television news was presided over by some of the most celebrated names in broadcasting history. NBC offered the double bill of David Brinkley and John Chancellor. Walking down the middle of the street. Walking. A sight nobody here had ever seen before. Good evening. The new president of the United States has begun his life... ABC in News was co-hosted by a new million-dollar-a-year recruit, Barbara Walters. The transition was smooth and colorful and quietly dramatic. Good evening, Jimmy Carter of Plains, Georgia. But it was CBS and Walter Cronkite that came top in both popularity and prestige. He was sworn in by Chief Justice Warren Burger. 2 ноября в Кремле начались советско-вьетнамские переговоры. In the Soviet Union, television journalism was dominated by the evening news Vremya. It was the mouthpiece of the ruling Communist Party. Every important party occasion was dutifully observed in excruciating detail. Член Политбюро ЦК КПСС, председатель Совета Министров СССР, товарищ Косыгин. Член Политбюро, секретарь ЦК КПСС, товарищ Суслов. Член Политбюро ЦК КПСС, министр иностранных дел СССР. The BBC was the cornerstone of British broadcasting. Its journalism led not by news, but by current affairs programs such as Panorama. The world that television reported on was about to be turned upside down. What is he saying? Journalists weren't exempt from the forces which shaped other lives. Television itself was about to make the headlines. CBS News announced today that Dan Rather will be the next anchorman and managing editor of this broadcast. In February 1980, Walter Cronkite announced his retirement. This reporter will continue serving CBS News with a schedule, he hopes, a little less onerous than the daily one he's been following here for 19 years. Walter Cronkite had reached a status that people said if he read the telephone directory, um, he'd still be um, the, the dominant newsman. Um, because he, he had become America's most trusted man. I mean, he was on poll to be elected president. He exuded an air of confidence and trustworthiness. There was nothing, the camera, there was no one between him and the camera. He was what you saw. Dan Rather, one of CBS's top reporters, succeeded to the most coveted job in American television, anchoring the main evening news. The people who care the most about me, people very close to me and people who love me, said, Dan, don't take this job. The phrase, this is American slang, first person after Cronkite gets his head blown off, which is to say, anybody who succeeds a legend, comes in behind a legend, is likely to fail. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Good evening. President Reagan, still training his spotlight on the economy, today talked about a package of budget cuts that he will send to Congress tomorrow. Dan came in, it was very much like a royal succession. It was. Uh, and a tremendous burden, and uh, Dan for a while did very well, and then the comparisons to Cronkite became o almost overwhelming, and by six months later, the evening news had dropped from its dominant status to third. I mean, it, was, it was very much, clearly, the personality-related change was monumental for a while. To prop up the ratings, Van Gordon Sauter was appointed president of the news division. It was a controversial choice, a man with a background in local news hired to turn around the prestigious network show. There was a interior disparity, a, uh, uh, a true conflict 
between the anchor person and the broadcast he was doing. They're, they were just out of sorts. There was a dichotomy there that you'd sit in a room and watch it and say, my gosh, this is not a comfortable broadcast to watch. So we set out to correct that. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reports. We made Dan Rather, to put it most simply, larger in the screen. He filled the screen. We, in effect, brought him forward so that he totally dominated the screen. Very simple thing, but, it's, but it was very, very important. It was a big hit a few years back. Seemed to touch a nerve. Take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. Sauter decided to go further and radically alter what he regarded as CBS's old-fashioned elitist approach to journalism. We began to do stories that emanated less from Washington and New York and more from across the country. It's got a built-in audience of 10 million people. Hey, Johnny. We just made stories simpler, more accessible, um, stories that people could understand. And, of course, that brought a crescendo of dumbing down the news. I wish they'd open that old factory in the morning. Sorter's changes offended the CBS traditionalists. They believed he was wrecking a great American institution. And I turned nuts and bolts with a whole lot of love. I wish I had a job to show. It just seemed, as well as undignified, it just seemed silly to abandon a formula, a format, not a formula, a format that had worked so well in the many years of the past for something that we thought cheapened the coin of our, of our product. There will always be an England, and proof of that comes in this shaggy sheep story. As reported I remember when I was producing the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather, I, I ended with a piece that I saw on the, on the feed about a sheep in deck chairs having their nails clipped. It's just sort of a Friday um, uh, closer to leave people sort of with a change of mood and God, the ghosts came out of everywhere to haunt me on this. I mean, Eric Severide, a good friend of mine, called him and said, sheep piece, you know. That for years, I was Howard Stringer who put sheep on the CBS Evening News. Friday, October 26th, and Phyllis. Yes. It's been very good working with you this week. It has been day. a very challenging week, needless to say. and I've enjoyed For the old guard, worse was to follow. CBS now hired a former Miss America to present the morning show. Bring them back. We'd like sure. to see them, too. There was a very strong feeling that we should really be churning out an incessant number of stories about where goeth Germany. I said, guys, we can't do these things. We're not going to be doing one-hour shows on German reunification. It's just not going to happen anymore. We're in a different world. We may not like it. We may miss where we've been, but we have to live in the reality of where our feet are placed. British television journalists were also about to find their place in a harsh new reality. Okay. Your own time, the catalyst was a new prime minister unsympathetic to the usual way of doing things. Where is the evidence that your policies are successful or can succeed. Can I give you perhaps two things immediately? I remember the first major interview that Mrs. Thatcher did from number 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister. 55 people sought accreditation to come into number 10. Now, um, I, I sought to ease their passage with the Prime Minister in the sense that I said, well, look, you know, this is a live broadcast from Number 10. It isn't exactly uh, a studio with all the built-in technology, and therefore they will want to double up. But I must say, by the time I got to 55, I was beginning to draw the line myself. She, I think, exploded. 55, she said. And, of course, when ITV came in, there were still 55. But the BBC's coverage of Northern Ireland rather than overmanning was the principal cause of aggravation. Just before the election, Airy Neve, Mrs Thatcher's friend and advisor, had been blown up. The Tonight programme decided to interview those responsible. 
It had been something like two or three months since Erin Eve had been assassinated. And we wanted to know more about the organisation behind that, its beliefs, what it was about. It was part of a, 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 of a belief a lot of us had that our job was to find out and tell the British public what was going on in Northern Ireland, not what the government said what was going on, not what the IRA said, not the vast claims that were made by various people, but to say what is happening. Why did you murder Airy Neve? We had murdered Airy Neve because he was a militarist. He was, in fact, Margaret Thatcher's principal advisor. Mrs. Thatcher had lost a very close ally in Airy Neve uh, to interview the people responsible for his death was, I think, a provocation beyond imagining. Northern Ireland was again the cause of the next row. When Panorama filmed the IRA mounting roadblocks in the village of Carrick Moor, the government objected. The film was never used. Argentina has seized the British Falkland Islands, whose ownership she's been disputing with Britain for two centuries. Emergency meetings are going on in, the, in London between the Prime Minister and her Defence and Foreign Office Ministers, while there's been feverish activity at Royal Air Force and Royal Navy bases. From the cockpit of the Argentine Air Force jet, General Galtieri... Tension between the government and the BBC reached new heights during the Falklands War. He called it an historic moment. The BBC was determined to be comprehensive, reporting from both sides. A hero's welcome awaited the President from the new military governor, General Menendez. We took the line that um, we must uh, try and hear what the Argentines had to say. We had more material from Buenos Aires than we had from, the, from our own people in the Falklands, or on the way to the Falklands. And so that, that balance was, was tricky and caused a lot of trouble. There's a stage in the coverage of any conflict where you can begin to discern the level of accuracy of the claims and counterclaims of either side. Well, now tonight, after two days, it must be said that we cannot demonstrate that the British have lied to us so far. But the they were talking about British troops and Argentinian troops. They were being determined to be absolutely even-handed in this. And, and I think this, this certainly outraged Mrs. Thatcher. who said there are troops, and the BBC is part of Britain. Whose side are they on? <laughs> I knew there was going to be a row, and the question is when it would come. And it came with a particular edition of Panorama. Although we interviewed the Prime Minister at length, we interviewed some other people, uh, members of the Labour Party, other people in the country, who actually thought it was a mistake, that we shouldn't be doing this. The task force was putting our own lives at risk to protect 1,800 islanders 8,000 miles away wasn't sensible. And that caused a furious row. The BBC have again come under attack at Westminster, this time at a meeting of Conservative backbenchers. About a hundred MPs were there to question the chairman of the BBC, Mr George Howard, and the director general designate, Mr Alastair Milne. One MP said later, it was the roughest meeting I've attended in all my years as an MP. It was like going to the Star Chamber. It was like being, being ready to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Um, and although I tried as coolly as I could to explain why this particular panorama had had done what it did they weren't having it they shouted and roared and screamed and banged the feet and uh, and demanded blood the repercussions were slow to die down during the 1983 election one falklands incident resurfaced good evening nationwide tonight as the general election campaign gathers momentum we have the prime minister margaret thatcher in our studio to answer your questions for the next 35 minutes, we'll be inviting viewers around the country to put Mrs. Thatcher on the spot, as we call it. Ask all of the audience to send us questions, and from individual questionnaires, we sought out people we knew would be pretty independently minded and stick in there. We told them, don't accept the politician's answer, go after them. Uh, well, uh, lo and behold, up came the, uh, comes the question uh, of the Belgrano. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher, why, when the uh, Belgrano, the Argentinian mm. battleship, was outside the exclusion zone and actually sailing away from the Falklands, uh, why did you give the orders to sink it? But it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was in an area... Mrs Thatcher makes a factual error. ...danger to our... And uh, 
A lady from the West Country didn't let her get away with it. Mrs. Thatcher, you started your answer by saying it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was on a bearing of 280, and it was already west of the Falklands. So I'm sorry, but I cannot see how you can say it was not sailing when away from the Falklands. Was, when it was sunk. When it was sunk. It was a danger to our no, ship. But Sitting in the gallery while Diana Gould was going after Mrs. Thatcher, I was thrilled. I thought this was democracy in action. Of course, it was exciting television, but it also was what we all wanted. Ordinary members of the public cross-examining the Prime Minister. And why not? No, which I'm way not, about Mrs. Which way it was, it was facing at the time. a I danger am... to our ship. We took her downstairs and to the reception uh, room where her husband, Bernard Ingham, and others were waiting. Well, when we opened the door, uh, you know, um, Dennis's face was like thunder. He was talking about pinkos and lefties in the BBC, and I think it would probably take him about 30 seconds at the most for them to decamp and walk out. In the Soviet Union, Vremya, the evening news, celebrated the anniversary of Lenin's birth. The program was true to its nickname, Tractor News, on such a big day. Behind the scenes, however, the efforts to keep up appearances, in particular to make the almost senile Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev appear more youthful, became increasingly desperate. His speeches went on and on, sometimes lasting two hours. We were organized in two or three groups. One group would polish the first 40 minutes, the second group the following 50, and the third group the rest. So if he pronounced a word correctly in one part of the speech, but then put the wrong stress on it later, we would edit out that bit to correct it. Whenever he smacked his lips, we would insert a pause of one frame to disguise it. We were always resorting to such tricks, cutting, replacing or repeating something. It was a tiresome job. What can I say? We lived in a period of tragic comedy. Worse was to follow when two years later Konstantin Chernyenko assumed power. He was little younger than Brezhnev and terminally ill. The party went to extreme lengths during the 1985 election to mask the truth. They even brought a fake polling booth to his hospital room. They put a bust there, flowers and so on. All this was staged beside the bed of a man about to die. They tortured a dying man for the sake of a political campaign. They forced him to stand and read a prepared speech. For two days we tried to edit the unfortunate man's speech so that it could be broadcast. We did everything possible, but we were unsuccessful. In the United States, a new venture had been launched by the cable operator Ted Turner, which was eventually to change television news completely. I'm now going to read a, a little poem that was written by Ed Kessler of dedication to offer those who want it a choice for the American people whose thirst for understanding and a better life has made this venture possible for the cable industry whose pioneering spirit caused this great step forward in communications I dedicate the news channel for America, the Cable News Network. CNN was devoted exclusively to news. It provided a worldwide service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Allied nation. Vienna, Buffalo, Lima, Kiribati, Islamabad, Decatur, Nashville, Jamaica, Jonestown, Chicago, Weatherford, Pico, Tokyo, Madison, Fort Worth, Fort Wayne, Warsaw, Bangor, Ready camera one, box. Take 11, Mike Kewen. To New York. Stand by, ready three, take three, Mike Kewen. Three, start to slow zoom in a little bit. Roll tape, take three. Ready 13, full. Ready camera three, one center up. Good evening, I'm David Walker. And I'm Lois Hart. Now here's the news. President Carter has arrived in Fort Wayne, Indiana for a brief visit with civil rights leader Vernon Jordan. Jordan CNN's ambitions weren't matched by its resources. Its early existence was a precarious one. Survival depended on recruiting a younger, cheaper, non-union workforce and utilizing the latest technology. There was a, a whole load of technological breakthrough that had not gotten onto the, uh, onto the air yet. And we took advantage of that. We, digital graphics, all tape, very light cameras, tape editing done in different ways than had been done before, much more quickly. Marijuana shows potential risk to human health. The single most important factor in the democratization of news was the satellite because it changed the fundamental economics of distributing news and gathering it. You could bring it in via satellite and send it out again all over via satellite to users at a cost that made it possible for ordinary companies to do it and didn't require you to have a billion dollars worth of entertainment business before you could afford to get into the news business. Despite its tiny audiences, CNN had shown that news could be made more cheaply and efficiently. Profit-hungry investors and tough bosses asked why shouldn't the giants operate like that too? It unleashed a frenzy of takeovers. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. To paraphrase Pogo, we have seen the news and it is us. Today, for the first time since they were created, one of this country's three major broadcasting companies, this one, ABC to be specific, has joined in a cash merger with a smaller communications company. ABC was the first to be taken over. And although ABC is four times larger, Capital Cities has offered to buy ABC stock. GE announced that it was going to take over RCA. NBC was next, its parent company RCA swallowed up by General Electric. GE chairman John Welch said it would be a happy marriage. We are number one in lighting. We are number one in major appliances. RCA is number one in television. We know how to win in these markets. It was Ted Turner's day. Bright lights. Then the once unthinkable. Ted Turner, owner of Upstart CNN, threatened to take over CBS. We have decided to attempt to have the shareholders of CBS decide for themselves whether they would like to have Turner Broadcasting acquire control of CBS. CBS said it will have no comment until it can figure out what the Turner offer is all about. CBS got caught in uh, the volcanic explosion of the 1980s that included not just television, corporate takeovers and mergers, a new emphasis on the bottom line and the dominance of a corporation's stock price as opposed to the quality of the product. All of this was happening in America in the mid to late 80s. Van Gordon Sauter resigned today as president of CBS News. That was the latest of the changes which began yesterday when CBS announced that Thomas Wyman had resigned as chairman and chief executive. CBS Already weakened by rows in its news department, CBS turned to the Wall Street investor Larry Tisch for salvation. The old guard heralded a return to the old ways, but it wasn't to be. It was thought that he would bring organization and good management into what had not been a terribly well-managed company for the years between 1981 and 85. But instead, all he was doing, was he, his notion of how to operate was to cut back to cut bodies, to cut budgets, to cut all of the things that were needed to make the news networks what they had been in the past. A sad news item about CBS News. CBS executives notified more than 200 of our colleagues today that they are being laid off. Necessity to cut costs was given as the reason. These men and women are dedicated news professionals we will miss their daily contributions to this and other CBS News broadcasts, and we will always value their friendship. I always think of the 200 people that I let go. 
Um, and of that 200 people, there were some, I suppose, whom technology had passed by, but at the same time, those were people who had given great service to an institution, who loved it, who, um, who hated to leave it, and who hadn't really deserved it. But times had changed. Today, Howard Stringer, the president of CBS News, along with 60 Minutes producer Don Hewitt and correspondent Mike Wallace, headed for CBS corporate headquarters... Although the news departments of all the networks suffered traumatic change, CBS, the proudest name in American broadcasting, seemed engulfed in civil war. And I remember some correspondents saying, things are so bad around here that it's like nuclear war, the living will envy the dead. You know, and I used to say... Only half joking, he thinks it's so bad at CBS that people are stabbing each other in the front. In Britain, Mrs. Thatcher, basking in her Falklands triumph, won the 1983 election with a big majority. By now, she'd been in power long enough to take on some of the nation's established institutions. The BBC was no exception. Hello? It was the governor's job to monitor the way the BBC was managed. They began to ask more searching questions, and the answers they came up with were often not to their liking. William Rees-Mogg was the deputy chairman. I thought that the BBC was a business in need of substantial reform. I thought that this sloppiness of business in the early 1980s in the BBC carried over into a certain amount of sloppiness about the journalism, and as a professional journalist, I naturally didn't like that and was sometimes critical of it. The man the governors held responsible was the Director General, Alistair Mill. The governors, who should be the great of the good and represent the nation and advise and guide, actually increasingly became executive, became tricky, dyspeptic, difficult, um, and Im impossible to handle. Um, and that was a political decision taken by the Prime Minister of the day. That question. Relations deteriorated further when the government complained about plans to broadcast The Edge of the Union, a documentary about extremists in Northern Ireland. The film had been made without the Director General's knowledge. He was now absent on holiday. The governors decided to view it themselves. Martin McGuinness is thought by many to be the IRA's present Chief of Staff responsible for bombing the heart out of the city in the 1970s. I became involved in the Republican movement in uh, late 1970. and uh... We came to the conclusion, in my view rightly, that this soft interviewing technique uh, was inappropriate when you're interviewing somebody who uh, is a terrorist and uh, who is responsible for acts of, of, of great violence, and that you ought to put to him, how do you justify killing people? Uh, which is the key question with the terrorist. Uh, so we said that it, uh, as the Director General had not seen it, and therefore it hadn't gone through that part of the procedure, uh, the program should not go out. Not since broadcasting began in Britain has there been a day like it. No national and international news on radio or television. Little the governor's decision resulted in a one-day strike by the nation's television journalists. The governors began to conclude that the BBC was out of control. The Director General blamed them for bowing to political pressure. I think it's actually the most dramatic moment in the BBC's history, or one of the most ever, because it meant that the executive uh, suddenly were sidelined by the governors. The governors took an executive position themselves, which is not their function. Um, I mean, things may be better now, but they were not, in my time, recoverable, really. We're taking the message direct to the BBC with our media monitoring operations. Norman Tebbit, the chairman of the Conservative Party, attacked the BBC for biased news coverage during his conference speech in 1986. The pressure on the BBC increased. They will be hearing from us soon. we can judge who has made errors of judgment. A libel case brought by Conservative MPs accused of being right-wing extremists was settled out of court at the governor's insistence. And, uh, we can judge those who ought properly to be kicked out of the BBC in the same way as the Panorama programme said that we should be kicked out of the Conservative Party and kicked out of Parliament. 
and the series about the secrecy surrounding certain defence projects was postponed again after government complaints. BBC offices were raided by the special branch. The relationship between governors and director general was strained to breaking point. Good evening. The director general of the BBC, Alastair Milne, has resigned and tonight there's growing speculation that he was asked to leave. News of his departure came this afternoon after Mr Milne had been at a meeting with the BBC Board of Governors. There were several journalistic points, but the main thing was that people had ceased to believe uh, that he could run an organisation of this size and get it right in what were basically business and administrative terms. Okay. Could you sign up what for now? Sure, yeah. Sort of to have it first. Yep. Yes, that would be fine, just like that. We were aware One more. that times were changing. It's possible, in retrospect, that we didn't change enough with them. But I wouldn't have wanted to. Because in, in my own mind, that would have mean, meant ditching things that I held very dear and adapting in a way that I wouldn't want to, to have adapt, adapted. I mean, I, I'm a program maker by instinct and, and trade, as it were. And I wanted to make programmes as we'd always made them, in a sense of, with a sense of independence and freedom, and bigger. So if we had to adapt and go backwards, I wouldn't have wanted to stay anyway. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Leningrad, March 1985. Mikhail Gorbachev, in his first major speech as Soviet leader, began the process which transformed the Soviet Union and with it Soviet television. Вообще надо для Ленинграда поставить задачу такую. Вся продукция Ленинграда и Ленинградской области должна быть конкурентно способна на мировом рынке. Причём он возражал вначале, чтобы At first he objected to our showing his speech on television. We had filmed the whole lot. We insisted that he watch it. We said to him, look, Mikhail Sergeyevich, it's an excellent speech. You've transformed our perception of a leader. We saw a new face, a new image, a new kind of leader, the kind of leader we've never even dreamt of having. After some hesitation, he said, OK, broadcast it. Television, Gorbachev realized, could serve him well, bolster his own popularity, but also act as a vehicle for reform. In Ostankina, Moscow's television center, the boss of state broadcasting summoned his producers. I said to them, you have dreamt all your lives about making better, more interesting programs, always afraid that the leadership would not allow it. But now, let's not just dream. Let's suppose that we have been allowed to do it. The revolution began in the youth department. Granted more freedom to counter the growing influence of Western pop culture, it attracted more rebellious producers. The program, 12th Floor, was named after the area where they were based. They were fresh, new faces. They were less conformist and younger. All the dangerous people were sent to the youth department because they would do less damage there. The idea was to assemble members of the Soviet establishment in the studio and allow them to be cross-examined for the first time ever by young people. It was like a grenade exploding. Each time the program was broadcast, it marked a radical step forward. After two or three months, the other programs also started to change. It occurred to them that if we could ask questions, then so could they. Good evening, Vladimir Posner. We greet you from Seattle, Washington. We see you gathered with uh, 
approximately 200 uh, citizens, residents of Leningrad, and we trust that you see us here in Seattle. The next yeah, step was to adapt the format for international co-productions. They were called Space Bridges. My pleasure to say good evening to you from the USA. What is the city of Gorky and what is it used for? Uh, this man implies that Gorky is a place to which uh, critics of the Soviet system are sent, including Andrei Sakharov. The American audience came to uh, the studio to ask questions. Why do you have uh, Gulag? Uh, what's going on with Mr. Sakharov? Um, why don't you release him from Gorky? Uh, what kind of genocide there is in the Baltics? People are talking about out there in the street. Stuff like that. That was absolutely out of sync with uh, the mood of the Russian audience, Soviet audience. And uh, the Soviet audience was shocked, really. А Сахаров призывал даже вас, Соединенные Штаты, развернуть войну против нас. Он выступает против народа. И выражая волю народа, его правительство поселило в такой город, где нет иностранных консульств, которые устанавливали с ним связь для того, чтобы использовать ее для антисоветской пропаганды. Против меня. Я поддерживаю эту линию правительства. There was uh, no communication during the show, during the like two-thirds of the show. The key moment of it, I believe, was when a fisherman from Alaska stood up and said, I wish this wouldn't be all so political and we could get to know you. Uh, I think it's a bad way to start. I wouldn't have come here if I would have known it was going to be this political. I thought I'd get to get a chance to know more of the Russian people. Uh, this show, you've got to realize, is one of controversy, and that's what they're trying to do now. And I really feel unfortunate. I wish we could sit down and meet with you and talk. Then a gentleman in uh, Leningrad studio stood up, uh, a painter, and he said uh, that uh, I totally support what uh, this fisherman said. I want to shake his hand across the ocean. So that was like a break, you know, in the whole thing. We got uh, sacks of letters. I mean, literally sacks, like a room like that would be filled to the ceiling. Uh, with his letters, and people were, some were uh, praising the show, some were saying that uh, bourgeois propaganda took over our ideals, uh, so it were mixed kind of uh, reactions, but uh, definitely nobody was uh, left untouched by that show. Foreign leaders were now invited to appear on Soviet television. Margaret Thatcher. The first was the scourge of British television, the Iron Lady herself. Госпожа премьер-министр, разрешите прежде всего поблагодарить вас за то, что вы нашли время встретиться с нами, ответить на наши вопросы. Главное, что нас вызывали накануне. The day before, we received a call from the Central Committee, telling us to pressure her about atomic weapons. Приезжать, как сказано. That was ridiculous. How could we put the Prime Minister under pressure? However, we obeyed the order and tried to convince her she should reduce her atomic arsenal. She, of course, crushed us in a very elegant manner. Can I, can I just answer this one first? Look, she answered each question in a very precise way. She was, however, never faced with a counter-argument. As soon as she answered one question, one of my colleagues asked her another. So nothing she said was queried, and she came out on top every time. But you were the first to deploy intermediate missiles, SS-20. So, just 
Но госпожа премьер, даже Вашингтон нас не обвиняет в нарушении договора про. Скажите, а вы заинтересованы в чем-то еще? Нам э, э, троим, так сказать, вот мы стали как бы жертвами гласности. The three of us became the first victims of glasnost. It was the first time we had conducted such an open interview, and Mrs. Thatcher won hands down. Предложение господина Горбачева приезжать к вам. Благодарю за вашу доброту. Давайте надеяться на лучшее будущее для всех нас. Время нашего интервью подходит. Нас долго критиковали повсюду. We were criticized by everybody because we had let the Soviet Union down. What could we do about it? We won't be allowed to forget the episode for the rest of our lives. Такой эпизод, конечно, он запомнился на всю жизнь. If five-year plans were passé in Moscow, they were now de rigueur in the BBC. Good morning. In the next half hour... The new Director General, Michael Checkland, assembled his top brass for an internal broadcast. Five years. A new man, hired from London Weekend Television, was brought in to reorganise BBC journalism. Let me first ask John Burt, Deputy Director General, to talk about news and current affairs. Thank you, Mike. The chief goal of the new directorate will be to build the authority of the BBC's news and current affairs network journalism. The BBC had gone through a very deep trauma. It was an organization which, for a very, very long period of time, had not had senior people coming in uh, to the organization from the outside world. And I was as, as welcome as a Protestant made pope. John Bird was least welcome in Lime Grove, the home of current affairs. He not only planned to amalgamate it with the rival news department, but also to bring its practices in line with his old company. The people who were left had to deal with the people who came, and uh, it was not exactly a happy time in, for us to learn their new methods, or to learn ways of satisfying their new methods, and to find their dissatisfaction with the culture that they inherited there. This is about where I think I'd like to take the shot, Peter. Yeah, right here. If, um, if you stop there, yeah. then we'll try not to get run over the process. Yeah. Today, in the House of Lords, the government finally lost its global battle to ban Spycatcher, the book that alleges treason by MI5. Conflict wasn't long in coming. A panorama about Peter Wright, the author of a controversial book about the security services, commissioned by the old management, was now delayed. Their approach, I think, and that was not just John Burt's own approach, but also the people he brought with him to the BBC, was of reducing the temperature and changing the agenda. In other words, instead of uncovering, it would be to expose not wrongdoing, but to expose the logic of certain arguments to explain and analyse. And this ultimately, I think, coupled with a deep desire not to offend the government or the opposition or anybody in authority led to a new blandness. The new output was praised by the so-called Bertists for being analytical and agenda setting, but attacked by the non-Bertist faction as boring and unadventurous. Good afternoon and welcome to the first edition of On the Record. If the government has its Always way, judge systems by their the outcome. Will be the role we put out a string of really difficult programmes, I would say, of greater difficulty than anybody else in British television or elsewhere in British journalism during that period. We, uh, we put them out and we got them right. And we got them right. Yeah. Right, so you're on the South African yes. piece. Yes. Uh, we get to election. Yes. Right? While those in current affairs moaned and groaned, those in the news department yeah, rejoiced. Baker 31, got 33 and 4 now. 33 and 34 have gone, everybody. So we go to... Budgets were increased, more specialist correspondents hired, and foreign bureau were opened. To be able to deploy that amount of money and those numbers of staff on any story you cared to and still remain within budget, is a, is a moment in history that no people will repeat. Uh, the, as I say, these were very heady days. The investment coincided with radical change in Eastern Europe. In the main square, the battle was even more intense. And the army's strength was overwhelming, given that there were probably never more than a hundred or so snipers holed up in the surrounding buildings. 
we had a satellite truck which was on the road and seemed to be charting every revolution, every border that changed, every piece of mischief in, in Romania. This piece of equipment could do no wrong. You know, whichever country it went to, you know, a, a dictator was overthrown. Whichever border it crossed, the border became an open border. And it became a joke in the newsroom here that, you know, wherever you send it, you know, wherever you send it. In fact, the joke in the newsroom was send it back to the BBC, we could do with a few overthrows. To their supporters, the coverage of events in the Soviet bloc vindicated the policies introduced by Czechland and Bert. But criticism was slow to subside. You can argue that the, the very saving, the salvation of the BBC from the wrecking of the Tory right who wanted to do away with the licence fee, do away with public service broadcasting, these were factors that I don't deny had their part. But it meant for BBC current affairs journalism that things were put on hold, that there was less bite, less attack, ultimately, I think, less integrity. And perhaps one can say, looking back, that it was the nadir of good BBC journalism. In March 1993, John Burt himself became Director General of the BBC. We have won our independence as an organisation in a way that many state broadcasters around the world have not. We, we uh, people accept widely that we have the right to do difficult things, to tell difficult stories, to challenge those uh, in power and authority. But we are publicly funded and we have um, uh, governors whose job it is to represent the wider public interest. The BBC has no choice but to get it right. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting tonight from Tiananmen Gate in Beijing, China. Good evening. This is where, 40 years ago, Mao Zedong stepped into the place previously... For embattled CBS journalists, revolutions elsewhere provided a welcome respite from civil war at home. Tiananmen Square is the heart of China. This is where most of the major confrontations... CBS News had one of its great times in its storied history uh, in our coverage of Tiananmen Square. Uh, was I excited? You bet. I had a 3,000 calorie attack about once an hour, just being excited with passion of covering the story. The mood is serious, but not angry. Determination, not rage, is on the faces and in the voices. Not that anybody needed reminders, but they were reminders of why one got in the business to begin with. One didn't get in the business to get one's picture in the front of Time magazine or to make millions of dollars a year. One got in the business to be out there on the cutting edge of a really big story. As events turned violent, CBS broadcast a live special from Tiananmen Square. It was a critical triumph, but in the new commercial climate, lost advertising revenue mattered more. I took over the network that night, and all night long, broadcast live from Tiananmen Square. Prevent him from doing what he has to do. I'm rather convinced that uh, that was the beginning of a slippery slope for me. You can't trust a fellow who'll do that. Uh, there go those commercials. And there, it, was the, it was the concluding act of Dynasty, which was some show, I can't remember it anymore, I don't think anyone else can, on the CBS Entertainment Network. How could you possibly have done that? Uh, so that's, <laughs> well, that's a very untrustworthy person. By the end of the 80s, reforms begun elsewhere in Soviet television were finally implemented in news. Воскресное утро 12 ноября. Остается лишь несколько минут до открытия нового перехода между столицей Германской Демократической Республики и Западным Берлином. Reporters were stationed at the border between East and West Germany. It was a miracle almost as remarkable as the collapse of the Berlin Wall itself. Soviet television carried exactly the same pictures of Tiananmen Square as the Western networks. Domestic coverage was also beefed up. Crime was on the increase. This report showed a kidnapping taking place. Queues for food were growing longer. And corruption was commonplace. Commonplace. 
But there were limits to what was acceptable. Many of Gorbachev's reforms backfired, and he himself was criticised by the very journalists he'd initially encouraged. He had second thoughts about television. He told us our coverage of the situation in our country was too one-sided. We should talk not only about the shortcomings, but also about the successes and achievements. We sensed he was uneasy. We felt we were reverting back to the early days, when though we did have freedom and glasnost, the president had more control. When the news carried shots of ethnic unrest in Azerbaijan, enough was enough. Further coverage was forbidden. The editor of the news quit. I decided to resign from the job of chief editor. As a man, I could no longer either remain silent or lie. During the last three or four years, I'd become a different person. As the threat to freedom grew, the producers of the satirical program Vzglad decided it was safer to record their show at home rather than in the studio. Soviet television seemed to be slipping back into darkness. August the 19th, 1991, one of the most important days in the history of the Soviet Union and certainly the biggest in Soviet broadcasting. Vremya led with a proclamation from the Communist Party. В связи с невозможностью по состоянию здоровья исполнения Горбачевым Михаилом Сергеевичем своих обязанностей президента СССР на основании статьи 127.7 Конституции СССР вступил в исполнение обязанностей президента СССР с 19 августа 1991 года. Gorbachev had apparently decided to step down of his own volition. Vremya showed his successor's press conference. An interview with the general in charge of the security of Moscow suggested that nothing was amiss. In fact, there'd been a coup, and as the programme was going out, Vremya's editors agonised about whether they dared broadcast a report revealing the truth. They went ahead. Армия действовала сегодня в Москве быстро, и буквально за час-полтора танки, бронетранспортеры, БМП и другая военная техника прочно обосновались вокруг Кремля, на Манежной, у Большого театра, Моссовета, Верховного Совета России и на важнейших магистралях города. Мы, конечно, не претендуем на отражение всей полноты картины, сложившейся в Москве, но даже то, что вы увидите в этом репортаже, кажется, передает главные краски сегодняшнего тревожного дня в столице. 19 августа, 17 часов 20 минут, мы находимся на Краснопресненской набережной, включили свою камеру без особой надежды попасть сегодня в эфир. Получился я единственный журналист. I turned out to be the only television correspondent in this country, reporting on the events of August the 19th, who tried to learn the truth about what was happening in Moscow. Afterwards, they called me from Pravda and said, what do you think you're doing, giving instructions on how to reach the barricades? That's how they regarded my report, and I'm very proud they did. А к середине дня стало уже известно, что Борис Николаевич Ельцин подписал указ, в котором квалифицировал действия комитета по чрезвычайному положению государственным переворотом. By showing that there was opposition and that it centered around Boris Yeltsin, Medvedev's report helped undermine the coup. Мы выдали практически все. Я считаю, что это. We showed almost everything. I consider this to be our greatest victory. August the 19th was not a day of disgrace for the Vremia program. We showed everything we could. During Glasnost, we could say most things, but not everything. On August the 19th, Vremia showed everything.
democracy had been saved and television had played its part. Russian television journalism had finally and dramatically come of age. But over the next few years, its exponents were to find, just like their new comrades in the West, that freedom had its price.